Well, thank you. And uh, healthcare is very important, particularly so with uh, global pandemics uh, taking us all to task at the moment. So uh, we need all the help we can get. You don't say I haven't noticed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but well, well, today joining you, and I'm just inviting uh, everyone to the stage, um, we've got uh, Tom Bunce, uh, Chief of Security at Virtual Health, uh, Michael Arcoleta, uh, CIO at Mount, Mount San Rafael Hospital, and Esmond Kane, uh, CISO at Steward Health. Let me just make sure I've got everybody. Uh, we've got Tom, uh, and let, I think we've got Michael. I think they just start their, uh, their, their videos. And it, it, it's, it's really good to see this blend. Uh, so, so we've got people on, on both sides of the, the house, uh, f physical and uh, digital. Uh, Richard, uh, what are you going to talk to us about in your panel? So, you know, one of the big concerns at the moment around, um, uh, around healthcare security is doing more with less, right? We've got an evolving, um, constantly changing, rapidly changing um, environment in healthcare uh, with increased digitalization, interoperability, and an exponential growth in what I call healthcare IoT, right? Um, HIoT, um, an expansion of medical devices uh, to replace nursing staff or to supplement nursing staff, and a, a general growth in the level of technology that we use to diagnose, manage, monitor uh, patients. Um, all of this is putting immense pressure on uh, security teams to keep patients safe, uh, whether it's a, a loss of you know, PHI, PII as a result of uh, a theft, whether it's an extortion attack, uh, and we've seen a number of ransomware attacks against healthcare since COVID began, or whether it's the theft of uh, clinical research and intellectual property, as we've seen from, uh, you know, uh, from nation states that have been out there trying to steal uh, cures to, for uh, COVID, right? Uh, so they can take their product to, uh, to market uh, before, uh, you know, the established pharmaceuticals can. Oh, very, 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 very important. And, and just to double check, we've got Mike uh, Archuleta on. Are you on the audio, not the video? Are you there, Mike? Hey, how are you? Again, yes, it's, it's Michael Archuleta, and uh, I am on uh, audio. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, I will let, let Richard have the floor and ask, ask the questions. Uh, we're all good to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for the introduction there, Fallon. So I'm Richard Stainings. I'm Chief Security Strategist with <coughs> Silera. We're based in, uh, in Manhattan. Uh, we solve the, um, the healthcare IoT uh, security monitoring and management problem. Uh, for a large number of, uh, of hospitals and medical providers around uh, around the world, <clears throat> and uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm also heavily involved in Hims, Chime, um, AHIS, and a number of other healthcare organisations. And in my spare time, I manage to to find time to uh, participate in in educational, uh, illuminating panels uh, and uh, conferences, uh, as uh, Felim has put on here today, and uh, also managed to. Uh, to teach uh, some postgraduate uh, cybersecurity courses. Um, with that, I'd like to, to go around my panel and allow them a couple of minutes to talk about themselves and where they come from and what they do and what keeps them up at night. So, Tom, you're the first on my list. Why don't you, uh, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Richard. Uh, my name is Tom Bunce. I'm Chief of Security at Virtual Hospital in Marlton, New Jersey. Uh, I've been with Virtual Health now for 12 years. I started as a Security officer per diem on the weekends, and uh, from my time with Virtua, I've gone to school. Uh, I'm a senior at Rutgers right now with a major in criminal justice and sociology. Prior to my time with Virtua, I was a member of the United States Air Force. I was security forces for four years uh, at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Um, I can tell you that uh, over the past six months, the things that have really kept me up at night was was really thinking about my team and how all of the challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis anyway has now been enhanced from the COVID-19 response because the people who are now coming into our facilities are sicker than they than, than previously. They are requiring more hands-on care, one-on-one -on -one care for nursing. They're needing a lot more technological interventions, whether it's a somebody who needs to be on a vent or needs ICU space, our infection control team has been heavily hit by this. So really, how do we continue to provide the services that we normally provide 
and then they're now enhanced because of the COVID-19 response. Cool. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Esmond, tell us a little bit about your, uh, you and your life uh, in today's uh, COVID environment. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so my name is Esmond Kane. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Stewart Healthcare. Uh, Stewart Healthcare is a nine-state US-based healthcare delivery organization. We have about 35 hospitals. And you know what's keeping me up at night is, is meeting the needs of those hospitals. We've had an exponential increase in demand as much as some of those hospital systems in, in the East in Massachusetts and such have, have weathered the storm. Uh, some of our other systems in particular in Florida and Texas are currently undergoing that same kind of uh, spike and hotspot that we saw up here some months ago. So it, it's really meeting that need, it's, it's perseverance, it's stamina, it's keeping the lights on while we've also had a, um, a 300 to 400% increase in attacks by our adversaries. So it, it really comes down to um, perseverance. It really comes down to keeping an eye on, on the goals and making sure that uh, when you're taking these expedited uh, measures to, to meet that increase in threat and risk, that you're not actually magnifying some of your internal problems. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Esmond. Mike, uh, if you're there, uh, introduce yourself and say a few words, please. Hey, thank you, Richard. Hi, my name is Michael Archuleta. I am the Chief Information Officer with the Bridge Care Health Network, Mount San Rafael Hospital. So we are basically five facilities here in Southern Colorado. And uh, I've always been focused on how do we basically continue to move forward with the, the acceleration of digital transformation. And uh, that's really been one of my key elements moving forward is utilizing technology as an actual tool to improve outcomes, especially improve outcomes in the healthcare industry, which is a much needed industry when it comes to a focus on digital transformation and the utilization of technology. I think what really keeps me up at, at night, just like everyone else, is the attacks of opportunity. That's, that has been a major problem. I think during COVID has been one of those items on, uh, you know, like I always state, is your home in order? You know, a lot of organizations were having problems and basically implementing uh, strong telehealth initiatives, strong uh, remote access uh, initiatives and uh, I mean there's there's been a lot of relaxed items and that's one word I really hate and uh, I think we need to continue to basically move forward and continue to basically put IT digital transformation as a core component to the organizational strategy which again will take us to a much better place moving forward so this industry needs a massive change and COVID-19 may have just saved this U.S. healthcare industry moving forward, especially when we look at the acceleration of digital transformation. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I mean, the, the whole delivery paradigm has changed, right, since uh, the end of February. Um, patients don't want to go and sit around a doctor's office um, to, see, uh, to, to see their general practitioner. They want, uh, you know, they, they want to be able to have a video consult and to be able to explain confidential information over an encrypted uh, video link uh, with their with their care team right and we have all had to adjust very very quickly to the acceleration of this digitalization of digital transformation in the industry and i think there's uh, you know it's it's putting pressure on us um to find the right skill sets the right resources the right capabilities technology tools uh people and process to to keep healthcare safe so tom I, for my first question i want to ask you around the resourcing, you know, at uh, you know, at uh, your institution down there in uh, Southern New Jersey, um, at Virtue Health, how are you coping with uh, attracting and retaining top security talent that you need for this for this new compute paradigm? Given the fact that things have changed quite significantly over the past few years. Thanks, Richard. So I think one of the things that uh, we were able to do really well uh, pre-COVID was try to look at the market and figure out how do we attract the best people to our positions. Uh, at Virtua, we do a couple of incentive programs, things like tuition assistance. We try to read market analysis and figure out if our, uh, our, uh, our starting rates and our promotional rates uh, work aligned with what our peers are doing at other places. Uh, in 2019, Virtua stepped up and said no employee would make less than 15.15 an hour. And these are all these are all just little things that I think really helped us stay competitive in a market that is now saturated for security talent. 
where somebody could almost write their own ticket if they have a couple years of security under their belt with some education they can they can pick their job right now it's it's really it's the candidate's market in my opinion that they can go and find the job that suits them best so we have to keep our 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 positions attractive for these guys so uh, competitive rates education opportunities and as many amenities as possible so it's something that i don't think you will solve with just okay we're going to just do it this way i think you have to constantly keep reevaluating every year to two years to make sure that you are competitive and read your market so if you notice that you're losing people, where are you losing them to if you get a chance to exit interview? Are you losing them to law enforcement jobs? Or are you losing them to your competitors in the healthcare market? I think that's something that we have to continue to do. Yeah, uh, and I, I would say the, the problem of you know, staff retention, certainly quality security staff retention, is particularly acute in the tri-state area. I mean, I know from trying to attract and retain staff in New York that it's, it's almost impossible. You're competing against you know, Wall Street and a lot of very, very well-funded uh, New York organizations. And people are quite happy to jump on the train from New Jersey and come into the city or, you know, to work for a, a New York company that's uh, willing to double their salary, essentially. Uh, and of course, today that means working from home. So that's, that's even better. But how do you get the top, you know, the, the specialist talent? Are you able to secure, you know, people with, um, <clears throat> with uh, cyber threat intelligence skills or digital forensic uh, capabilities or, um, you know, and I don't know too much about uh, uh, virtual health, but, you know, are you able to run a 24 by 7 SOC, for example? And if not, is, are these capabilities that perhaps might be, you know, best outsourced to, uh, to an MSSP? And I think it's dual. I think the internal talent that we have uh, combined with someone in a, in a vendor role, really make sure that we are competitive with what's out there and keeps in mind that what we're looking for as an organization is always front and center. So I think it's twofold. I think you have to have the right people inside and I think we have great people inside. And then also when you pair yourself with organizations outside who are looking at the market, who know what's going on, who are seeing the trends, and can advise you to make the best choices. I think it has to be twofold. Right. So some kind of partnership combined with you know decent man management capabilities in order to keep your staff uh, around. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for that, Tom. Esmond. So are we? As I mean, you run multiple multiple hospitals all over the country here. Um, you know, in terms of the skills gap, uh, you know, bodies are one thing, but um, a sea of generalists. Um, is that really what we need, given the transformation of, of healthcare, given the digitalization, the growth of HIOT, for example? Uh, for, from my perspective, uh, Richard, is, you know, I'm a big believer in continual recruiting. You need to know who's on the marketplace and you need to know what skills that they can bring to the table. But there's a set of core skills that you really can't negotiate on. Those are a lot of those soft skills around communication, interpretation, delivery, accountability, ownership. These are the nascent leaders that you build programs around. So I do agree that generalists can self-destruct uh, to a certain extent. They will take too much ownership, they will burn out, you'll end up with a fatigue issue. Uh, but they, they have a play, it really depends. The nature of this organization is changing so rapidly. Just in the last five months, as we heard from both yourself and, and Michael, uh, COVID has transformed healthcare rapidly. And four or five months ago, you may not have needed so much experience around things like uh, BPN, posture assessment, conditional access, um, you know, endpoint hygiene, or hardening at the endpoint, whereas you do now. So you need those soft skills that somebody will be accountable, step up, take ownership, learn, right? But you also, on the other hand, need a certain core skill set where you have dedicated personnel working in specific capacities. My the way I influence my teams is, is I don't want them to niche themselves or, or kind of postpone some sort of debt by which the, the skills they acquire don't have any longevity. It's really that focus on learning. It's being adaptable, flexible, knowing how to communicate. Those are the skills I, I focus on as, as a general level of, of baseline accomplishment. Beyond that level, the hard skills I will train. I use that as a retention mechanism. Uh, if I can send you to a class, that's excellent. Um, otherwise, perhaps I, I will expose you to a lab or on-the-job training. That's more for, the, for the, the, the development. But I also broaden across my team and expose these training opportunities 
to as broad an audience as possible. You will never know when you need to know something. Uh, one of the things that I heard both you and Tom mention there is, is the turnover, right? Uh, you have to understand that healthcare isn't, as you mentioned, going to compensate as well as, as finance. But by that same measure, if you get that person who's altruistic, who can benefit from uh, the other kinds of programs that work from home, um, you know, the medical benefits and such that we can bring to bear, there's other reasons for staying in healthcare. If, if you're purely monetary or financially or mercenary based, then perhaps uh, I don't want you in my organization. You might be a prima donna. You might create more problems. I describe that sometimes as, as I try to recruit Watson. Uh, I try not to recruit Sherlock. You know, I want somebody that will roll up their sleeves, knuckle down and get the job done. I don't necessarily want someone who's brilliant, but by that same measure, you know, I have to soft pad or, or, or white glove to treat that they, they will tend to rapidly exit the healthcare information security programs, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've got a question here that I think is probably pretty pertinent. Normally I put questions at the end, but in this case, um, Esmond and Tom, I, or, or Mike for that matter, um, I'll, uh, I'll open this up. Brian Stone has asked, um, how do you provide additional compensation once you bring a resource with significant uh, additional skills? And I think that's relevant because, you know, a lot of cyber specialists are demanding uh, or their market value, should we say, um, can often be more than the CEO of a, of a small hospital system. I'll start before I hand it over to Tom and Michael. I think Tom had mentioned it. You need to do that competitive market analysis to make sure that uh, your your pay rate is equivalent to your your region. Uh, but by that same measure, um, now that we've got COVID in play and remote working is now on the table, perhaps it opens up other recruiting grounds. Um, so I, I do, as I mentioned earlier, go after those 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 candidates, if I'm aware they're, they're in the market, they're interested, they're dissatisfied, maybe I can attract them based upon the culture or you know, the other caliber of, of the staff that they're working with. Or I definitely do add in a lot of things around, around skilling and upskilling and continual education, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, Tom, great. Michael. Tom, any additional comments? And you're on, you're on mute, Tom. Love technology. Um, I, I really agree with Esmond, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the person who, you know, for me in South Jersey, it doesn't have to be the person in Philadelphia or the person in North Jersey or New York now. Are there resources in the Midwest or on the West Coast or even abroad where I now have a brand new pool of applicants and candidates that you can reach out to and be competitive with? I, I think we should not sell ourselves short thinking that we're not competitive with, our, with, with other people. Right. So other uh, other incentives other than, you know, monetary uh, monetary bribes to come and work for the organization. So, Mike, you're a CIO. You're the you're the big man over IT and security um, at Mount San Rafael. Um, how do you deal with this? How do you attract people to, um, you know, to bridge care? How do you retain them? Um, what incentives do you use? Yeah, absolutely, Richard. So in, in my opinion, most organizations really don't have a workforce strategy when it comes to security. I think that becomes an actual major problem. And as everyone touched, you know, culture is such a big issue as well. You know, the, the healthcare industry has been one of those industries, as I always say, is, you know, we're, we're really behind the curve when it comes to digital transformation. You know, when we look at the finance industry, when we look at the natural gas industry, I mean, we're several years behind the curve in regards to that. But again, you know, what's really important, too, is, you know, your overall culture. You know, how mature is your organizational digital culture? When I say that, it's like, well, what does that have to do with cybersecurity? Well, you figure if the culture is not basically built and there's not an understanding of the importance of IT and digitalization within your organization, how do you expect to continue to basically improve on more investments when it comes to cybersecurity initiatives? when it comes to really bringing in top cybersecurity talent, because we know the lack of cybersecurity talent is a systemic issue, and that's basically the bottom line. And it becomes a major problem in finding individuals in regards to that. And then another thing too is, you know, you really get what you pay for in the long run. You know, are you truly willing to basically invest in a strong CISO? Are you truly uh, willing to invest in a strong cybersecurity initiative program? 
And again, you know, it's really focusing on the maturity of your organization. And I always like to say too is we look at hospitals and clinics. Well, I should say I look at hospitals and clinics as digital companies that happen to deliver healthcare services. We are a digital organization. This is the digital age of healthcare. We need to change that specific concept and really move that around because, you know, as you know, the acceleration of digital transformation is truly here. And that's basically the bottom line. And looking at this overall crisis, this crisis has fully displayed the value of IT and digital transformation. And then when you look at the attacks of opportunity, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of these attacks of opportunity. We're seeing how cybersecurity needs to be a top priority, a core component to the organizational strategy. That means let's hire cybersecurity uh, professionals. You know, let's bring in top talent into this organization. Let's make sure that we are promoting a digital culture, a digital organization that is considered an actual innovative team. Because again, sometimes IT, your actual security teams, they're considered an actual cost center to the organization. That becomes a massive problem too. And again, it's changing that concept of what is IT? IT is no longer a cost center, but an actual profit center to your organization. Again, focusing on those cultural initiatives, bringing strong you know, visions into your organization and showing, hey, we're doing some awesome things when it comes to the acceleration of digital transformation. We're focusing on technology. We utilize technology. Our maturity uh, level when it comes to digital culture is at a high peak. We see IT as an actual profit center. So again, you really want to move forward and try to build that overall strong cultural foundation in order to basically be successful when you continue to want to invest in cybersecurity investments and initiatives that are critical to the success of any organization, period. Yeah, so culture, you know, security culture, I, I think we all agree <clears throat> on the call today that security culture is is really a, a prerequisite to a successful security program, right? And that needs to permeate down from the CEO and the board of directors or the governance structure, you know, for uh, whatever organization you're in. Um, but, you know, there, there comes a point where, you know, there are a finite number of security resources. The Cisco security report for the last five years has consistently said there's a 12x demand over supply for security experience qualified security resources so you know unless you're willing to you know pay all your security staff a million dollars a year you know and and give them a portion of a dedicated parking space chances are you're not going to be able to get um these people and and then you know in that sort of competitive market they're going to up and move to someone who's willing to pay them two million dollars a year quite frankly i'm still w waiting for that million dollar a year opportunity so if anyone's on the call and willing to uh to uh, to contact me afterwards, I'm definitely open to offers. Although my boss is on the call, so I ought to be ought to be uh, ought to be nice to him, I suppose. But I mean, this is a very competitive market space here, right? Um, how do we go about filling the skills gaps that we need? The specialist skills gaps, as I mentioned earlier, is that through you know that can't purely be through recruiting. Is that is is that a partnership with um, different players in the space that can offer automation? And uh, is it a growth of things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to, to ramp up the technology and tools that are available? Or is it, um, you know, more of more soft skills, right? Bringing in a leveraged service model of, of providers, a managed service provider, a partner um, in, in order to do that. Esmond, I know that you've worked in the past in your past role um, with an MSSP. Um, you know, how, how did that go? And, you know, um, how is that from a, from a, a strategic uh, perspective? Yeah, so I ran with a, a managed SOC, uh, kind of a hybrid SOC. I, I had tier one outsourced and tier two and three on-prem. So at least initially what attracted it to me was, was to accelerate the program. My, my issue, as I found as, as time went on, was they didn't innovate. It was very much of a cookie cutter approach. And, you know, the, the, the onus fell upon me as the business leader 
to manage, uh, you know, not just the contract and the delivery, but also the, the, the metrics. It didn't end up being something that I would promote in, in future. It's a great way to jumpstart, but not, not something that, that I think has any long-term place in an organization. I found it more successful uh, further to what we heard from Tom and Michael and you mentioned uh, to, to upskill, to hire from within, to, to build rather than, than source. The sourcing eventually created its own gravity and indeed the, that entire organization that I outsourced to is, is in the middle of this slow implosion right now. And I'm not gonna name names. Uh, but I, I found it better to, to look at IT. I found it better. I'm very lucky to have a, a tremendous amount of universities local to me in Boston to hire uh, grads, um, I hope to keep them. They, they tend to turn over pretty quickly. Uh, they, they tend to job shop and they tend to job hop for the first few years. Uh, I tend to work very closely with uh, programs around army vets, uh, cyber warriors and such. Uh, and such. Uh, I, I bake into every one of my programs, as I mentioned earlier, a skilling requirement. So my staff are guaranteed 40 hours of CPEs, typically through you know, a SAN certification or you know, even something like O'Reilly or, or these other kinds of upskilling. And now certification doesn't mean that you're getting the, 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 the skills necessary to accomplish your job. I also make sure to bake into every acquisition uh, a, a sufficient amount of training credits so that people are, are also skilled. And then also you gotta take it around and, and look at what the people are doing and making sure that there's no single points of failure, that there's sufficient cross-functional training going on, because you never want to silo somebody into a position that may not make the best of their skills. Um, so look at advancement, look at progression, have that kind of coaching discussions. Yeah. Tom, a few quick words. I'll, I'll say when, uh, when you're bringing someone into your organization, when you're looking for the person who's the best fit, it's important that they don't see themselves as outsiders, you know, that they're just here for that job. You know, everyone in Virtua is a member of the Virtua team. So every single one of us is responsible for the best possible patient experience, best customer service story possible. So just because someone works in cybersecurity or if someone takes care of the trash, every single person has ownership that their responsibility is to make sure that we're providing the best services to the customer. So it's, it's being inclusive to the people that you're bringing into your, into your organizations to say, you're not just here because you're good with this, or you're not just here because we need this. It's because we want you to be part of our team. That's, that would be my opinion on that. Yeah, it's, it's establishing that culture of security. You know, and in healthcare, we have a very labor-intensive business by and large, right? If you include everyone involved in, in direct patient care, you know, everyone involved in back office like billing and, and what have you, right the way through to the facility staff. And I think, you know, as security leaders, if we can permeate a message to say, it's everyone's concern to keep patients safe, to keep our IT systems up and running um, and free from cyber attack. Don't click on links, right? Don't be uh, spearfished um, and uh, take the appropriate measures to, uh, to protect the institution and everything it stands for. Um, Mike, a few final words here in terms of, you know, I wanted to come back to, you know, the comments you made earlier around uh, digitalization, interoperability, HIoT, the 21st century challenges for healthcare, right? Um, and relate that back to, you know, skills and, uh, uh, and partnerships and expertise. Uh, a few final final words before we, uh, we finish up here today. Yeah, absolutely, Richard. So again, you know, we do, we know that we do have an issue uh, when it comes to cybersecurity attacks, the attacks of opportunity within the healthcare sector. We know that 83% of healthcare systems are running on outdated software and unsupported operating systems. We know that, you know, there's a lot of specific medical devices, you know, that have a high chance of being hacked. I mean, there was a specific percentage that uh, there was 40 million Americans that were affected uh, due to this. These, these are all problems. And again, what we have really learned, uh, especially with the acceleration of digital transformation during COVID-19, is that IT, digital transformation, cybersecurity initiatives have to be a core component to the organizational strategy because this is not a technology makeover, but an actual business revolution. And we have to look at it that way. Again, you know, organizations need to see 
our technology team as innovators and profit drivers. IT can no longer be considered an actual cost center, but a strategic revenue contributor. And we need to start seeing our technology team as your innovation team. And that is such a critical component because again, we always come to these events and we focus on technology, 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 but we forget that people are our number one aspect. People process then technology, focusing on those initiatives, bringing in a strong culture of understanding of what would happen if a cybersecurity breach basically happens within your organization. Again, we need the culture reamped in the healthcare industry for us to continue to bring in these strong cybersecurity investments, these ways to allow us to automate, utilize artificial intelligence, create a hybrid model that gives us that overall focus, that, that Hawkeye view within our organization. These are important elements, ladies and gentlemen, and this is such a critical component. Make sure IT is a core component to your organizational strategy. Yeah, these are certainly interesting times, as uh, Sunza would have uh, would have said if you were alive today. We're uh, we're going through a dramatic uh, digital transformation. Um, you know, technology is just one component of it. So, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for for your comments there, Mike. Uh, thanks also to Tom and to Esmond for your uh, your very illuminative uh, insights, and uh, greatly uh, greatly appreciate you joining uh, me here on stage today. Fantastic! Thank you, Richard, for being such a great moderator. Uh, it's 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 great to welcome you back again. Uh, please give Richard and our fantastic panelists a, a lovely virtual round of applause. Um, I'll start off on screen. Thank you. Thank you, it's, it's, Thank you guys. It's great. I, I look forward to welcome you uh, to, to, to another one. You, 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 you've uh, very kindly moderated so many nice uh, panels, and this is, a, this is a key feature of the debate. So, so thank you. My, my, my pleasure. All right. Fantastic. Um, so, obviously, today we've looked at the MSP of the future. We've looked at the secure MSP of the future and the MSS. And we've gone down a few... Uh, you know, silos to say, okay, well, what about uh, the world of healthcare and uh, what should the MSP in healthcare look like? Um, by the way, thank you. We've got some very nice comments in the audience. Uh, Chris uh, Ware says uh, IT needs to be seen as a profit center, invest now, pay later. Uh, Brian Stoner had, had some follow up uh, points about uh, recruitment and retention and training, so that's really good. Uh, Esmond Kane also uh, wrote, wrote some nice stuff. Uh, when, when you're commenting, uh, please do uh, click uh, all panelists and attendees. Uh, otherwise, it's just me uh, and, and the panelists that get uh, your message and not everyone else uh, there. And a very, very short shout out. I wanted to say hello to Matthew Porcelli. Uh, welcome to the event. Uh, Matthew is part of, uh, of course, ASIS, ASIS. And I know that he's uh, joining a, a very nice African initiative. And I wanted to uh, do a shout out earlier. Uh, I, I know that, uh, uh, that that's, a, that's a great initiative. So thanks, Matthew Porgelli. Um, moving on, uh, I am delighted to invite to the stage uh, Drew Sanford uh, from uh, ConnectWise. Drew is the Director of Technology Enablement at ConnectWise. And it, it, it's a pleasure to, to, to welcome Drew to talk about the evolution of the secure MSP of the future. Um, 